Good, good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Claiborne. I am a biology professor at the Padron campus. I'm not quite sure if we're going to be able to get into the the activity because it, it's um it's long, but it's also fun. We get to work with dinosaurs. But I'm going to try to do my best. All right. So here we go. Um, I don't know if you all are aware, but there has been a pandemic in the past year or so, and that kind of changed the world. It basically shut the world down, and we had to adapt, right? So um, this was because of COVID-19, and a lot of progress has happened uh, regarding how we can deal with pandemics over time. So um, let's just talk about the risk factors. Why should you be concerned? Well, COVID-19 can affect anyone. Um, it's a new disease, and we're still learning a lot about how it infects people, how it can kill people, or just complicate your life. I mean, you could be an athletic person, get infected with COVID-19, and all of a sudden it's a, it's a lot harder to go swimming or running or play basketball. And even more important is the fact that certain populations are more at risk. Think of our grandparents, our parents, or even great-grandparents, and, you know, we don't want to shorten their lives because uh, because we're we're not protecting ourselves and in essence um not protecting them. And also if you have underlying conditions such as diabetes or asthma or kidney disease, um these are things, you know, that we want to we want to make sure that we protect ourselves and also protect these people. Um and so how do you do that? You do that with vaccines. Um that is one way of, of many ways. And so normally a vaccine takes about, you know, roughly, it can be, it's, I have here, you know, more than 15 years, but it depends on the virus. Um, so anyway, to be, the, what am I getting from this slide? It usually takes more, it takes longer than a year to develop a vaccine, especially something like the novel coronavirus. So why does this matter? Well, Often we test vaccines on animals before we test it on it. And so that takes time. And so certain steps, I'm just going to read it, certain steps cannot be rushed, such as the way to see whether antibodies against the virus develop in response to the foreign agent being introduced to the body. So we need to see this. We need to test this before we just make a vaccine and give it to people. But as stated before, we typically test the vaccines on animals before we do people. And so what are antibodies? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, any, antibodies basically are a part of our immune system, and they typically neutralize or allow other um, immune cells in our bodies to detect this foreign invader. And so let's take a step back and learn about immunity. So this is just a brief overview. I'm not going to get into the weeds of the immune system. It's literally like a, a hour and a half lecture. But I want you to know, I want to build a foundation for you so that we can transition to phylogenetic trees and clay the grounds and, and how they can help us with vaccines. So immunity is just the ability of an animal to ward off internal threats, such as microbes, microbial toxins, and cancerous cells. You, as of right now, if you are breathing, you probably at some point today are going to breathe in fungal spores. Uh, you often are breathing in viruses that might be on particles in the air, but you don't even notice. Why? It's because your immune system is uh, attacking these invaders um, before they reach numbers that can be harmful to your body. And what's really uh, special about, uh, let's just say, uh, mammals in particular, is that we have an acquired immunity. So we're able to, after exposure, we can target these invaders specifically. And that actually, the repeated exposure will elicit a greater defense response. So I just want to highlight, let's see if I can circle on it. I cannot. Okay. Oh, go back. I just want you to see that what's really important about our acquired immune response is that we, if you can look at the image on the bottom right, we develop memory B cells and memory T cells. It is these memory cells that allow a future infection, let's say of COVID-19, to be less severe than getting infected the first time. And that's often what vaccines are going to do. They're going to uh, help your immune system generate these memory B cells. 
But as I said be, before, before humans, we test animals. And so um, in this case, we this is just an example from a lecture where you test the RNA vaccine against the West Nile virus. And so here they use cats and dogs. And what I want you to see at the table at the bottom is that the low dose vaccine for dogs was 100% effective. These Both the cats and dogs were exposed to mosquitoes that were positive for West Nile. And you can see for the most part that the vaccine actually worked. So do we share a common ancestor with dogs and cats? And does it matter when testing for a vaccine? Well, yes, it does. You don't want to test a vaccine on frogs if we don't have a similar immune system to frogs. So our immune system is more is, is is more similar to cats and dogs than to let's say like um, reptiles and amphibians, and that's why we develop these these cladograms or these phylogenetic trees to understand our evolutionary relationships. Because in this case of developing a vaccine, you're going to want to test it on animals that are more closely related to us that we share a more recent common ancestor. So this leads to the theory of evolution, which is just the heritable change in one or more characteristics of a population or species from one generation to the next. And how do we, what are some evidence? From physical features, there's a word called homology, which is just similarities resulting from common ancestry. So here we can look at the bone structure in the human arm, um, a cat's front limb, a whale's flipper, and a bat's wing. And so these are homologous structures, and we can use these physical features to place them on an evolutionary tree. But beware, because bats and birds both have wings that are developed from their arm, except that the bats use the, their fingers, their digits that's stretched out um, for their wings, while birds just use their arms. Their fingers aren't stretched out to form the bird wing. So analogous structures can make it very difficult because we might group animals together that are actually uh, that actually don't share a recent common ancestor. So we might call this convergent evolution, which is that they evolved um, in similar environments but in different areas, and um, now they look similar because of that. Another great example would be cacti and the new world, so like let's just say cat, like a cactus in Mexico versus some of those spiny plants in Madagascar. Those two plants are not closely related to each other, but they have similar features with the spines and the succulent stem because they live in desert environments. So you got to be aware of that. And so here's other evidence from homologies. Now we use DNA, right? But today, we don't have a machine for you to do this, so you're going to have to do it looking at these dinosaurs to make your tree. So here is an evolutionary tree of dinosaurs and, and when they were around, so the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period. And so you're going to do that today. So this is a simple clay to ground that we often teach in biology regarding the evolution of tetrapods. And the question is, how do we know that this is the way it should be arranged? Well, you can use physical features, so homology, as I stated earlier, but if you were to get paid to do this in a laboratory, you would use the genetic material, their DNA, to determine the evolutionary relationship and how closely related they are to each other. And remember, this all goes back to the vaccine, you're going to want to test the vaccines on animals that were more closely related to than a distant relative. So, what's my time here? Okay. So, we're going to make, I'm going to help you make the first one. I'm really going to need your participation. Uh, I can't tell if your cameras are on, but you're going to have to uh, talk to me to fill out this tree. I have to figure out how to physically draw on here. Let me see if I can draw. All right, so um, I'll, I'll just start it off. Uh, so they all have wings, so I'm just going to put a one here. Okay, now what about spots? Does A have spots on it? No. Nope. Nope. What about B? Nope. No. 
No. About C. Yes. 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 D. Yes. Yes. E. Yes. 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 F. No. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, circle bodies. A. Yes. Yes. B. Yes. Yes. All right, and I just put zero, 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 and uh, I'll do uh, antennae. Does A have antennae? No. no. Okay, what about B? No. No. All yes. right, C? Yes. Yes. D? Yes. yes. All right, so now we have, uh, okay, who has jobs? I think they all have jobs, right? All right, so now we have mm -hmm. the needed information. So these are called characters. These are the... Uh, what these organisms have, and we're going to use these physical features to put to build a tree. Um, and so I put that right here: wing, spot, circle, body, jaws, and antennae. Now, when you make these, when you make a cladogram and you try to depict this, you know, like relationships, we don't want to use a character once and then bring it back. So I'm going to use a bigger, uh, a big word. It's called parsimony, but it's the idea that these these cladograms are going to base are going to are going to um are going to be made based on the fewest changes needed to create your tree. Uh, so Occam's razor in statistics uh, states that the simplest solution often is the solution, or it's the best solution. So now look, there are trade-offs. There are some things that can be lost in evolution and then um, gained back. But for this sake of for this class, we're not going to do that. All right, so I have to change to the mouse. All right, so I'm just going to move these around. So I'm just going to extend this line, and we're going to make a tree out of it. So the first thing is we want to make our plankton. By the way, I typically do this with my students, and then they have to – they have to um, make their own with the dinosaurs. We're not going to have time to do that, but I just want to show you how we start this off. So this, so plankton goes here because plankton is the out group. And now we need to kind of organize these beetles. So before I erased it, we we used wings, right? And so we know that they all have wings. So what separates the beetles from plankton? we would assume that the animals that left the water developed wings. So that goes here. Now we can start aligning our beetles. And what is the easiest ones to deal with are going to be the A and B because they don't have antennae and they also don't have jaws. But we need to separate them from each other. So let me just put this here. And so we can put beetle A here. Actually, we could put, no, it doesn't really matter. And then, so these are going to go here because they don't have spots, jaws, or antennae. But what do they have? What do they have that the other beetles don't have? Out of the four characters, which one do they have? Uh, circle body. Yes, they do. So we can put that here. Oh, it's too big. All right. So they have. So that's that's what group. That's how they can be grouped together. Now we need to. We have four more beetles to work with, right? But we need to figure out how we're going to arrange them. So we have the. So they all have jaws. So we can put that here but they don't have, um, so that goes here, but now we're going to move this here. We need to sort them out, right? So let's see, we have, they all have jaws, but two have antennae and three have spots, right? So do we want the spots to go 
do we want to tackle antennae first or spots first? Which one do you think would be the best option? And there's no right or wrong answer. We're playing around with this. This is the first time that you 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 might have done this. So, you want to do you want to uh, do spots first or or jaws? Jaws. Oh, sorry, spots or antennae. My bad. We already did jaws. So. So let's spots? do spots, right? Because now we can put, we can put H or F right here, okay? And now we have three left. So we know that two of them have antennae and two don't, right? So that means right. let me duplicate this. That we can basically go here. and put this here oh my we're almost done oh i do not want to do that i want to change it to font size 10. and then we can put d here and c here and i'm going to delete that and we can put h e here so this is our clay to ground when we did this together and you can see how you can sort them out. So based on physical features, we know that they all have wings. So we assume that because they all have wings, that evolved first. And then a group separated into having circle bodies, and then the others had oval bodies. Later on, they developed jaws. So this group, the, the four up here, developed jaws. And then later on, some with jaws developed spots. And then even after that, some with spots and jaws develop antennae. So this is how you would make it physically based on physical features. However, the best way is to actually look at the DNA, look at their DNA, and you would see how similar they are based on that. But like I said before, that typically requires a lot of chemicals and machines to do that, which we would do in lab, but this is what we're going to do in class. So um, basically, if I had more time, I would have you all work in groups, and you would do the same thing with the different dinosaurs. To So I, I basically divide the class up into five groups. These are some of these dinosaurs are from Jurassic Park, and they have to arrange their tree. There are slightly different dinosaurs in each one, and um, and then explain to, to us how, explain to the, the instructor how they were able to develop their tree. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Um, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I would like to ask a quick question. Uh, excuse my ignorance, but the, the word cladogram is wasn't so, wasn't a word that I had heard before. Uh, has it been around for for a long time? Um, well. So I, it, I shouldn't do this, but I do interchange. Uh, so the the best word is actually phylogenetic tree, um, uh -huh. and that's when you create the tree of life, right? But phylogenetic trees are based on like evolution, and which is typically going to be based off of molecular um, molecular samples. Cladograms are just kind of with a cladogram, we assume evolutionary relationship, but we don't know. So you just organize the animals uh -huh. based on the physical traits that you have, and then you try to to see how like I organize it where I kind of group like these all share this and then move further up. They only this group share that. So you can do that, but the problem is, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, convergent evolution or analogous mm -hmm. structures like the bat wing and the bird wing, where you might kind of group them together, even though bats are like mammals and birds are birds. So a cladogram is more appropriate for what we did in class where we're just looking at physical features, but the best word would actually be a phylogenetic tree. But we didn't use any okay. genetics today. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, are there other no questions problem. that anyone would want to ask? Okay. Well, we I, I'm going to share this uh -huh. on Blackboard so you can have access to, to this presentation. Okay, well, I want to.
we, we want to thank Absolutely. Uh, Looking forward Freeburn. to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to, to, I guess, leave, right? And I'll see you mm -hmm. all in later sessions. Okay. Okay.